Good morning, dear participants. I would like to welcome you all to the third and final day of the Epicure Forum, which is organized by the University de Strasbourg and it is hosted by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. Great to have you all with us today if you're joining us on Zoom or also over on YouTube in the live stream. My name is Kim von Reischach and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for this third and final day and we have a lot of fantastic things planned for you today. Before we begin, however, I would like to give you a couple of uh, brief notes on our netiquette if you are new to the Epicure Forum. We ask you if you're joining us on Zoom to please turn off your camera as well as your microphone. This is to ensure your data protection and high quality streaming. Questions can be posed into the chat right here on Zoom just under Q&A and I'll give you a little bit more information on that later. If there should be too many questions and we don't have time to answer all the questions, please accept my apologies in advance. We will be deactivating the comment section over on YouTube because we do not have the possibility to get questions uh, sort of in real time over from YouTube over here to Zoom. We also offer you two types of support. If you are joining us on Zoom and you have a technical issue, please just send a private message to IT support. And if you have difficulties joining the meeting in general, then you can uh, click on a link which is on the Indico page. It is public.zenfcall.de slash Epicure support, but that's a lot easier access directly on the Indico page. On the Indico page, you can also gather information about uh, the program today, the speakers. We have the virtual startup tour, which will begin in just a few moments. We also have a panel discussion. Then we have the Erasmus Feeling Challenge, which will be revealed today. The winners will be chosen by none other than you today in our with our voting system. And of course, we also have the closing later on this evening. For the next part, however, the virtual startup tour, it is my great pleasure to hand over the uh, moderation uh, baton, so to say, to my colleague Alexander Titel. He's from Entechnon, the Institute for Entrepreneurship at KIT, and he's also part of the organizational task force of the forum, and he will moderate this next segment, and I'll be uh, waiting in the virtual wing, so to speak, taking any questions that you, dear audience members, have to send them to Q&A virtual startup too. And with that, Alex, it's over to you. Gibsy, thanks a lot for your introduction. Um, dear participants, dear startup teams, dear viewers on YouTube, a warm welcome to the virtual startup tour also from my side. My name is Alexander Titel. I'm a PhD candidate at the Institute uh, for Entrepreneurship, Technology Management and Innovation at the KIT. And together with my colleagues, um, I had the honor to organize the startup tour event and invite the teams to the virtual stage. Now in this session, startup teams from different European countries will present their innovative solutions for European challenges and we will learn how both courage and creativity of entrepreneurs can help us to overcome obstacles and also contribute to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, before we start, let me share some words about the Epicure project and the role of the virtual startup tool within Epicure. The Epico project aims to connect regions and establish strong networks among researchers, educators, but also students and young entrepreneurs to foster education, innovation, and entrepreneurship. With this forum and the startup tour, we want to develop and offer a first international European platform to present innovative solutions and uncover the potential of young entrepreneurs from partner universities. It also aims to connect those teams and make use of synergies, knowledge, as well as experience transfer. Moreover, this platform and our future activities within Epicure are intended to be used for getting in touch with investors, uh, business angels, with mentors and industry experts, or even partners to foster early internationalization as well as meet future employees. With that said, let me briefly introduce the program of today. In our 90 minute session, the teams were asked to prepare a 10 minute presentation each, introducing themselves, their business model, their uh, business idea in general, but also give us an insight and overview into their local entrepreneurial ecosystem by first, 
presenting three interesting facts about their location, the so-called entrepreneurial ecosystem. Second, naming three reasons why founders from APQ regions should consider their location as a potential market for their business activities. And third, they will present three reasons why uh, teams want to connect to startup teams and partner up with stakeholders from different regions. Now, as uh, Kimzi also said, after each session, um, we will have a short Q&A session. And so please write your questions to the Q&A master um, in the chat and we will discuss them after the presentation. With that said, I'm happy to hand over to Saji and Lila from the startup Noor Medical in Freiburg. Saji, um, the literal st stage is yours, so you can um, share your screen and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Alexander. Let me share my screen. Okay. Many clinics around the world don't have access to safe surgery. This affects billions of patients around the world. I learned about this challenge when I managed this, the construction of this clinic in Chad. To address this issue, we first looked at existing solutions on the market. None of them provide a sterilization solution that is safe to use and sustainably usable in our use condition where repair parts are not available, maintenance is unavailable, and electricity is unstable. Our technology, the Hybriclave, has gone through multiple rounds of reiteration and reprototyping to arrive at this solution, which can sterilize medical instruments up to the standard of the WHO using the energy of the sun or inputs from gas or even charcoal. Furthermore, We've been working on making on creating a safe surgery ecosystem because providing a device on its own is not sufficient when staff cannot monitor sterilization or when staff have no way of overseeing the surgical scheduling taking place uh, at their clinics. We will be testing our solution and piloting in clinics in Uganda and Kenya with the uh, uh, organizations listed below and this is funded by the Dubai Expo Live. So for the next 12 months, we will be visiting clinics, implementing our solution and seeing how it changes lives. And in, matter, in terms of changing lives, we aim high and we aim to uh, change the lives of 12.5 million people by creating a better surgical ecosystem for them, uh, which in turn eventually will improve the health of the communities and improve their employability, reduce income inequality, and address gender issues where women suffer the most from uh, unsafe surgery. This is in the case of C-section surgeries that cannot be delayed. Our, our solution will allow all this impact to take place. We know that we cannot take the path of safe surgery on our own, and this is why we always seek to partner with new partners that can help us increase our impact be that uh, with the UN Environment Office or uh, other international organizations that focus on safe surgery and the inter internaliz internationalization of social impact. And the reason we exist in these partnerships is that nonprofit funding is becoming less and less dependable for providing sustainable and innovative solutions for the safe surgery market. When funding is unpredictable, it is hard to, to engage in frugal innovation, which is the approach that takes simple devices and just adapts them to become more useful in markets. One size does not fit all in the scope of surgery and healthcare, and this is why we exist, and this is the impact that we want to reach. Thank you very much. And now I turn over to Leila, where she will discuss the Freiburg ecosystem and entrepreneurship in Freiburg. Just one moment, I need to stop screen sharing. If this, oops. Okay. Uh, yeah, Leila. Yeah, hello everyone. My name is Leila. I'm also co-founder at No Medical and currently involved as an advisor as I recently started my PhD at the University of Freiburg. 
And yeah, I'm pleased to uh, talk a bit about the uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem in um, uh, in Freiburg, especially for those of you who don't know uh, Freiburg yet. So even though Freiburg is quite a small city in the middle of the Black Forest, it has quite a few uh, interesting offers for startups. These include accelerator programs, uh, such as the Spad Grid Accelerator Program, but also in the region, like for example, in Karlsruhe, there is the Grow Accelerator. Uh, Founders Club uh, also offers quite a few um, possibilities. They will also be part of the panel discussion later on. And uh, then there is the Baden Campus Accelerator Program in Breisach, and the Health Price Accelerator Program also just started um, uh, its reach in, in Freiburg at the University of Freiburg um, as one of the largest student uh, social impact accelerator programs around the world. In terms of financial support, there are programs like EXIST or FMV. FMV is a student led venture group that provides convertible loans for startups, but you also have access to uh, financial support in terms of uh, research and development through, for example, the Fraunhofer TechBridge um, program or regional competitions. In terms of institutional support, um, you have access to consultancies, for example, through Greenhof and Gründerbüro, and they also offer uh, co-working spaces. And there's also a variety of uh, support in terms of tax support, uh, accounting, and legal support. Uh, provided, for example, by Bansbach or Friedrich Graf von Westfalen. If you're looking at uh, Freiburg as a potential um, area to expand your business, um, there are quite a few unique uh, characteristics uh, of the region and the city itself. So as um, some of you may know, Freiburg is known as the green city of uh, Germany. So everything that is related to sustainability is well placed here. Uh, this ranges, for example, um, to startups dealing with uh, sustainable or regional food systems or environmentally friendly uh, transportation. But you also have access to a large number of graduates uh, through the U University of Freiburg uh, that deal with environmental and sustainability issues. So if you're looking for experienced staff, that would also be a good region to, uh, to settle in. And then geographically speaking, if you're looking to expand to um, additional markets like France and Switzerland, uh, Freiburg would be also a good location as uh, it is um, located quite close to the borders to France and Switzerland. In terms of uh, connecting with you, um, the, the startups and uh, the audience, um, we always looking to uh, uh, to expand um, our network and engage in uh, resource and information sharing, especially with uh, uh, social impact uh, enterprises that operate in low to middle income countries and more specifically in East Africa. And No Medical is currently also looking to expand its team. So if you're interested or know about someone who's interested uh, to join this vision, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And yeah, a few points points uh, that would be interesting for us to discuss later on in the Q&A session are investment options, especially for social enterprises in Germany, or corporate social responsibility funding schemes and uh, platforms to identify interested people in social entrepreneurship. And with that, I would like to conclude this presentation. But please, um, if you would like to get in touch, uh, feel free to note down our contact details and we're happy to either address your questions in the Q&A sessions uh, later on or uh, at a different time slot afterwards. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, um, Saji and Laila. Thank you very much. Um, do we have some questions from the chat? Okay, Alexander, let me check right now. I am looking, there is uh, one question um, that we have right now, and this is, of course, uh, the appeal to you, dear viewers, if you have questions, not only for the very first startup team that just did a fantastic presentation, I might add, well done, Asaji and Leila, you did really well. Um, but if you also have questions for the remaining five startup teams that will be um, presenting their innovative ideas and their entrepreneurial network, then you can pose these questions by simply sending a private message to Q&A virtual startup tour. So question I have for you, um, Leila and Saji, is how do you use partnerships to overcome the obstacles? And I'm assuming you've had a multitude of obstacles. Thank you very much for your question. So there are two, there are 
challenges we faced are twofold. I'll address the bigger one, and that is regulations. So what devices you use to sterilize medical instruments is tightly controlled by the law, which means that at the moment for a German company to produce a medical device for sterilization, it has to be able to operate fully automatic. Such a device becomes inoperable in East Africa because when repair parts are not available, you can't operate such a machine. Also, the expense is quite high. In that case, we decided to take a low-tech approach, but also partner with institutes that understand high-tech and understand how to turn high-tech into low-tech. Namely, Fraunhofer FAP. They have helped us develop the vacuuming functionality in our device that can operate non-automatically, but still allows clinics in East Africa to sterilize safely. And then we're seeking regulation in those regions, partnering there with African healthcare business and the University of Makerere to make sure that uh, our device is safe to use. Even if it's not up to European regulations, it can be up to the WHO sterilization standards. Now, speaking um, about networks in terms of the Epicure network, is there any way the Epicure network and alliance can help you overcome obstacles that are potentially uh, placed in your path? Um, we are seeking more partnerships with, uh, with uh, healthcare partners that are interested in reaching out in East Africa. So if any of the startups involved or any of the network partners involved are interested in entering the market, we're happy to help there. And if they're interested in partnering to bring more uh, frugal innovation devices to the market, we are also very happy to uh, partner. Leila, I have a question for you also. You were mentioning investments just a little bit earlier. What are the next steps in terms of um, investments? Yeah, so we're continuously looking for investors that are um, on board with the mission of uh, uh, frugal innovation and providing low-tech solutions for underserved markets. And yeah. this is uh, quite a specific field, like uh, mostly in, in philanthropic investment. As uh, So... Yeah, currently we're mainly identifying potential investors, uh, and so so that would be an interesting point uh, if someone has uh, knowledge about uh, uh, networks in that area to uh, get in touch with us and share your insights. Great, thank you. Before I hand over to um, Alex, I have one more question for you. Leila, you mentioned the new talent platform um, at the end of your presentation. What could uh, possibly be done by the Epicure Alliance to help form this platform to identify? Yeah, that's quite an interesting question that you should also um, address in the uh, panel discussion later on. Uh, Founders Club, for example, they developed a platform but I think that's mainly for the region Freiburg. So if you could uh, develop a similar platform uh, Europe-wide, that would be quite interesting. Thank you, Leila. Alex, over to you. Thanks a lot. So I think we will have a little bit more time um, when each team presented. So I will, we want really to give the stage and the time also for your presentation. And afterwards, if you have some time left, we can also discuss even more. So thanks a lot for, for your insights, for your presentation, Saji and Laila. And then we would move on to Valentin from Kern Devices. So Thank Valentin, you. I would like to invite you now to the virtual stage. Thanks again to Laila and Saji. Hello. Can you see my uh, presentation? We can see your presentation. Nice. All good, and we hear you. So I'm uh, Valentin Peu, co-founder of uh, Kern Devices. And a uh, few years ago, I went to China for an internship in uh, civil nuclear power. The day before the presentation of my uh, result, my uh, laptop uh, broke down, which made me think. Back in France, I uh, gather a team and uh, we study the laptop market. And uh, we notice that uh, the plan obsolescence of the laptop is very high. And uh, at uh, our time, it's very difficult to repair laptop and the upgradability is complex. So we have uh, lost all control of, uh, over uh, our computer. So the, we imagine a solution, a modular laptop. So a uh, laptop uh, with a um, block. In the block, we, we have a um, component like uh, CPU, GPU, uh, RAM. 
and uh, we have a removable screen, a removable keyboard and touchpad, and uh, this permits uh, no risk of breakage and uh, reparation in a few seconds. So our business model is quite simple. We sell a modular laptop. We will sell a modular laptop and we will sell um, new components in the whole life of the laptop. The whole life uh, is estimated to uh, eight years. So we have a good uh, climate relevance with uh, this uh, innovation because uh, we uh, don't um, we, uh, when the, the laptop is broke, we can repair the laptop. So we reduce the toxic and radioactive series during the extraction of the rare earth. Uh, the structures are recyclable. Uh, thanks to the aluminum, we reduce uh, electronic waste and abuse. We uh, avoid the production of a greenhouse gas to produce a new laptop. So we are a team of uh, six persons. Uh, this is here uh, the four uh, co-founders of uh, Carn Devices. We are a pluridisciplinary uh, team. And uh, now we are in the final uh, prototyping uh, phase and uh, we aim to um, go in production in uh, mid uh, 2021. Our uh, targets are the gamer, the people uh, who like uh, Linux or uh, touch by uh, open source, and uh, obviously uh, the ecological people. Our study revealed three unmet needs, the upgrade of the laptop and uh, the repair, and to master uh, their computer. Now I will talk about uh, our uh, local uh, EE. So in France, when we are uh, in the university, which uh, we started, you have the PEPIT system. And uh, in Strasbourg, the PEPIT system is called uh, ETENA. Uh, in ETENA, uh, you can have uh, entrepreneurial student status which help you to manage uh, your entrepreneurial project and uh, your uh, study. And after you can uh, pass uh, entrepreneurial student diploma. So you have a course about um, accountability, business model, marketing, things like that. And uh, PEPIT advise and assist uh, students with an entrepreneurial uh, project. After uh, we go to an uh, incubator in uh, Strasbourg, it's uh, Simia. And the first step is uh, the starter class, and uh, which is um, a course of uh, six months with uh, many, many <laughs> subjects about, about uh, entrepreneurial. And uh, we have a specific uh, advisor and it offers also uh, office at a very low price. And when we are at uh, SME uh, level, which uh, are not uh, our case, we can uh, go in uh, Grand Innov. It's uh, like an uh, accelerator. It's also public. And uh, he, they gave uh, advice, uh, good networking with uh, other company in the, local ecosystem and uh, it's uh, the next step after uh, the incubator. So uh, why is Strasbourg an interesting place? Because in Strasbourg we are, um, we have uh, an highly interconnected startup network we, which is uh, very useful and it's uh, also a very dynamic place to recruit because the University of Strasbourg, particularly Germany, is, uh, I think, uh, a good thing. <laughs> and now it's uh, the moment to the, about the call to action because uh, we search for European uh, subcontractor. 
So we want to manufacture uh, locally mostly and avoid uh, ISEAN uh, subcontractor, but uh, it's uh, quite complex to find a manufacturer in uh, Europe. And uh, we have a willingness to expand in Europe our company. And uh, I think uh, learning how others are doing, it's uh, quite a good thing. So thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot to you, Valentin. So um, Thomas from IC Solution, he is also from that in industry and he is from Poland. So maybe you can get in touch with him and see if there's something possible to do. Um, Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, maybe I will start with a short question to you. So you said that you are uh, coming from the university and I guess that a um, um, uh, business idea was also developed during your studies. Yes. Now, um, since we are all involved in the university context and we want to you know, help young entrepreneurs to, you know, to develop their ideas and their, to create their startups. Now from your experience, what should university do to best prepare uh, students for their entrepreneurial career? What do you think? What should the university do? I think yeah. uh, the most important thing is to give time to the students. In France, it's a quite complex uh, problem because we are a lot of uh, aware, of course. And uh, the second thing, uh, it's uh, the, the course about uh, entrepreneuriat because uh, me, I uh, do uh, physics study. So I don't know uh, marketing or uh, accountability. So uh, this course was uh, very uh, useful to me. Okay, so it's about entrepreneurship education, you said, and also yes. to give time in terms of yes. during, during yeah, during during your studies that you can take some additional courses which are maybe not related to your core course study. Is that yes. correct? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Kimsey, do we have some other questions from the chat or maybe we have questions from other team teams, uh, team members? Feel free yeah. to ask. We have, uh, we have a chat question um, and that is why is it so difficult to find a factory in Europe? Valentin? Uh, because there is not um, a central place uh, to find a company in Europe. Uh, when we want to find a manufacturer uh, in China, for example, we just go on uh, Alibaba and five minutes after uh, we have uh, the good supplier and uh, we are uh, in communication with an uh, European uh, manufacturer is uh, quite complex. It's uh, about uh, one month of work to uh, begin to work with a manufacturer. It's not the same um, way to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have one more question for you. Can you tell us a little bit about the ecological evolution of your products? Yes. So uh, we want to create um, a uh, new supply chain in, uh, in the component, uh, reconditioning ch supply chain, because uh, we have um, two uh, opposite uh, targets. So the gamer, uh, we will ch they will change uh, their component uh, in the aim of uh, upgradability. And uh, ecological uh, people, uh, they just want to repair the computer. So we want to transfer the whole component of uh, the gamer at a low price to the ecological um, people mm -hmm. to avoid uh, waste. Thank you. I don't have any more. Oh, hold on. Here is one more question. Sorry. Um, does modularity in your case reduce portability? Uh, portability? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so. <laughs> portability, sorry. Sorry? Portability, sorry. Does modularity in your case reduce portability? Ah, okay. Okay. I understand better. 
So uh, yes, a little bit because uh, our computer has a, a little bit heavier and uh, not as thin as a MacBook Air, for example. But uh, it's not uh, too heavy. We are at uh, two kilogram and uh, 25 millimeter of uh, thickness. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So maybe we can also discuss the trend that we have right now that the computers, they're getting smaller and slighter um, over the time. And also um, people say that um, in future, we will not have any computers at all. We will have more or less these um, iPad-like um, devices. So we can maybe think about that um, also in, in, for our future um, discussions. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your presentation, um, Valentina. Now we would like to move on to Koime from um, Beetle for a Tech Company. Hello, everybody. I feel very honored to be part of this um, illustrious cycle. Already great um, enterprises we heard so far. Congratulations to the founders. I share my presentation. And everybody should see it by now. Yes, we do. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Let's disrupt global timber industry through technologies that will finally cut illegal logging. So we are really living the Epicure spirit. We are a team of four students. Anne from the University of Hamburg, Matthias from the University of Kufstein, Sebastian and myself, uh, Kwame, from Boku University of Natural Science in Vienna, part of uh, Epicur. Illegal timber market size is enormous. United Nations Environment Program, UNEP estimates that 30% of the worldwide sold wood is felled illegally. So it's every third tree. If you put all these trees together, this would result in a forest as big as the state area of Hungary being cut down illegally every year. Illegal logging is the most profitable natural resource crime and the third biggest transnational crime after counterfeiting and drug trafficking. It generates up to 150 billions a year. And it is more and more under control of, from under, of, under, of organized crime organizations. This often leads to human rights violation of indigenous people who are evicted from their ancestral lands, physically attacked or even killed. On the other hand, we have to use more wood from sustainable sources. The construction sector is responsible for a great amount of resources used. Concrete production is said to be responsible for up to 8% of CO2 emissions, consuming a tenth of industrial water used. Among materials, only coal, oil, and gas are a greater source of greenhouse gases. Healthy forests instead improve air and water quality, provide wildlife habitat, stabilize soils, and stimulate local economies. The most effective natural climate solution is planting trees. When implemented correctly, trees are currently the most cost efficient and best technology to carbon removal and storage. Timber supply chain documentation in today's world is a pen and paper based process, which can not avoid mixing timber supplies of various sources. This open doors to criminal organizations. Further, companies have to prove uh, the legality of their products and uh, resources, and the supply chain nowadays is more a uh, black box. So our technologies are developed in four independent sub-projects, of which one component is a satellite-based forest monitoring system that allows tree detection in forest stands and the location of a free tree marking device allowing us to close the loop and trace back the, to the exact origin of growth. 
our customers are at the one hand the forestry sector who can use our earth observation technology traders to prove the origin of their resources and goods and producers who receive high value and traceable raw materials and non-governmental organizations and governmental and governments around the world which whom we can conduct um, reforestation programs or monitor uh, protected forests so our progress to date we received offers from international test fields of companies, NGOs, and university on almost every continent. We got running prototypes of our key components. We still are further developing our system through research projects and multiple master theses. And we entered partnerships with technology partners and the industry. Our history as a startup is rather unusual because we got to know each other through participating at the hackathon. The topic of the hackathon was to find the solution for tracking wood down to the exact place of growth. Working together went so well that we decided to pursue our vision and go beyond. We already dealt with illegal logging during our studies and also came in touch with it in our private lives. So we simply strive to tackle this problem and want to be part of the solution. So at the base of our entrepreneurship, as a team stood a private initiative, the hackathon was carried out by the innovation in um, the Evergreen Innovation um, Foundation. One of the Evergreen private foundations mission is to specifically found forest and wood related education and training. There are, for instance, uh, associations like the GFF, the German Society of Food Science in Hamburg, who sponsored seminars, as we live in three different cities and two countries. It is sometimes necessary to meet in person and travel as long as the current uh, pandemic state allows it. The second and uh, the most vital ecosystem are in the universities in our case. It's where we develop our prototypes. We, are, we have um, two projects running at the University of Applied Sciences in Kufstein and, you know, and Boku. And there are also initiatives from professors who wants to foster um, entrepreneurial behavior in students with the likes of Professor Wimmer. Universities also offer other support programs, for instance, at Boko uh, BASE, which stands for Boko Activities Supporting Entrepreneurship. We are ha very happy to move in to a new co-working space in the Ilz Weinstein House, a new wood construction building. And there's also the SICK at Boko Students Innovation Center, an entrepreneurial student club for ideas and implementation of ecological social projects. I strongly recommend you to participate at the panel discussion this afternoon with the topic entrepreneurial students clubs at, as hotbeds for startups at universities. And there's also the public sector agencies. We are incubated at Accent, the lower Austrian tough tech incubator. The organization is financed by the European Union, the environmental ministry, and the lower Austrian provincial government. So they're basically, it's, it's the breeding ground for emerging startups. Funding includes financial assistance and general advices. Support comes in from coaching, networking, impulse sessions, and further gain know-how, to further gain know-how. And uh, they're almost reachable at any time, especially in challenging periods. And as financing is one of the most important issues involved in funding a startup, there are of course different public funding organizations where we apply for funding to, to realize sub-projects. The most important funding source in Austria are the Austrian Research Promotion Agency, FFG, and the Austrian Wirtschaft Service. Let's beetle together.
Well, thanks a lot for your presentation. Let's beetle together. That's, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, let me start with one first question. So um, the topic you just described is, uh, yeah, it's literally, you know, it's, it's touching us, I think. Um, but I ask myself, in which countries and regions do you observe the issue you just described, um, the illegal tree cutting? Which, which regions are there? It's, it's a problem of, of global scale, because at the one hand, um, regions of the global south are the main um, producers of, of tropical wood, for instance, but uh, it, consumers are located in, in the northern hemisphere, but also in, in eastern Europe, you find um, regions where illegal logging is, is a topic, so it's, it's of global scale, you have to say. Yeah. Okay, do we have something like this in Europe also? In Europe, yes, in, in Romania. Okay. And in bordering countries like Ukraine. And yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and what what do you do you already have a pilot project or partners that you develop your projects and your product with? Or how do you manage to get in touch with them? Because they are not like in Germany, they're somewhere. Um, yes, you said it's a global problem, but still, you, how do you get in contact with them? Through, at the, at the one hand, through universities again, because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, when you, when you investigate on, on, the, on the issues, you, you get to know the, the key players and what, what lays behind these problems. And I'm sorry that I couldn't go much more into details uh, concerning the technology, as it's uh, there's, um, I have to keep it a, confi um, a confidentiality agreement so far as okay. we are, are an early stage startup. Okay. And um, yeah, through with, with internet calls, with, with team calls, we, we attend them directly and try to, to, to find partners to further develop our goals. So we have different sub projects that we develop with different stakeholders and the response uh, in the industry uh, was very good so far, I have to say, and it keeps us going forward. Okay. Uh, now, if you if you now have the opportunity to reach out to many viewers, um, people from eight European countries and universities, what would you like to to say? What would you like to ask them, maybe? Yeah, I would like to, to encourage them to, to get in touch if they're interested in the topic. We are always looking to, to exchange. And even though in Europe there is, um, with the UTR, for example, there's um, um, a law in place that regulates um, timber imports generally. There are different implementations of this law in the different countries. So it's also interesting, or always interesting to to, to exchange on the national um, ways of implementing it and please reach out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Sebastian is a teammate of you. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can also share a few words and, and maybe you can say something from, from your side, from your perspective. Yes, of course. Uh, well, thank you for this opportunity today. And um, yeah, I mean, like like Kwame already said, uh, it's 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 great uh, at, at our university at the Boku to to get so much uh, positive feedback and also regarding your question, I mean, there there are many uh, like finding partners or companies. It's it's actually it's quite easy in this field because because it's such a huge problem and for for many companies it's uh, it's a it's a thing they. Already, already, already want to tackle, but maybe don't really know how to. And uh, I think that's that's very good news for for sustainable forestry worldwide. Okay, um, Kimsey, you have some questions for you for us. Yes, I tried to slowly sort of slide back onto the main stage so you could see, yeah, we have, uh, we have a whole bunch of questions, uh, Quima and Sebastian. So let me begin with the first one. What is your experience with the corporate sector? Are they interested in your product and what is their reaction? Um, 
Yeah, the, as, I, as I just said, the, the corporate sector, they, they are very interested. We, we started uh, um, discussions and, and collaborations with, with loads of, of companies, actually, companies and NGOs, but, but also like the corporate sector is very, very into it because they see these um, like programs or, or legislations like the EUTR, the European Timber Regulation, or also in, in the US is the, the Lacey Act. Um, these are very strong regulations that might need to grow a little bit over the next years, uh, or the enforcement needs to grow, but the companies know that and uh, they know they need, uh, they will need a, a, a solution very soon. So we got very good feedback from corporate side. They also feel the, the, the pressure from the consumer side as uh, consumers want to know where their products come from and uh, especially the younger generation is more environmentally aware. So, yeah. What about uh, certification organizations? Are you in contact with them like the um, FSC? We are. We started uh, contacting them, but... Uh, we are not in, in deeper negotiations so far, yeah. but uh, yeah, we have uh, products that could be of great interest for, for them too. And uh, can you tell us what is your experience with the corporate, uh, sorry, no, we had that, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> question. You answered that, I'm not gonna go into that again. Um, okay, so that's all the questions I have for you at the minute. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Good. So then we move on to Karlsruhe, um, the KIT, and Finger, Philipp Engelkamp from Eneratech is also a warm welcome to you. Um, the virtual stage is yours, and you also have 10 minutes. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Uh, can you all hear me? It would be nice to have a little uh, sign, or maybe we someone can hear says you. yes. Perfect. Can it's, you it's all perfect. Okay, uh, maybe you can also tell me if you see my slides. Should be online now. Yes, it is. Okay, great. So again, thank you very much for having me here. My name is Philip. I am the CEO of Ineratech, which is a company providing sustainable fuels. Uh, we are a company founded in 2016. Currently, we are more than 50 people and our headquarters is in Karlsruhe. We are a classical spin-off of the Katsu Institute of Technology. Well, what do we do? Um, actually, we are uh, certain that we will need hydrocarbons in our future. So basically diesel, kerosene, gasoline, and uh, other hydrocarbons for the chemical industry. Even if you take into account electric mobility, hydro hydrogen mobility, which we love, um, but uh, anyhow, we will need those hydrocarbons, for example, for aviation, but also heavy duty transportation and for vessels. And um, the message we want to spread is that hydrocarbons themselves are not bad. The bad news about hydrocarbons is that, that they're only available as a fossil product. And we are changing this. So basically we produce hydrocarbons, so hydrogen and, and carbon molecules. Um, we generate them from greenhouse gases. We have two options, either from methane so CH4, or we have the option of uh, the so-called power to liquid or power to X route, which is uh, highly interesting in, in Europe. So what we do here is we take carbon dioxide and we also take hydrogen, which we get from an electrolyzer. We put it into our plants and transform it into renewable fuels and materials, basically e-kerosene, e-gasoline, e-diesel and the waxes. And because we recycle the greenhouse gases, we simply call it greenhouse gas recycling. We can do that because we've developed, uh, the KIT has developed the technology for almost two decades uh, in the scope of chemical reactor technologies. So um, the, on the left side is the conventional reactor doing those kind of reactions and right next to it, the small blue dot is our chemical reactor, uh, reactor technology. And the message is that this reactor technology is suitable for renewable applications, which means that you can turn it off and on pretty quickly. You can follow the loads just imagine that the cloud covers your solar panel field, then of course, the load of the electrolyzer and consequently your amount of hydrogen is dropping. So you need to follow the load with your chemical plant 
And this is not possible with the conventional technology, but it is with our reactor technology. So a new reactor technology uh, uh, that follows, um, yeah, that, that can actually be applied in renewables is our core technology. And we built the, the chemical plants around that. We're not just selling the chemical plants. Actually, we're just making a, a shift into the so-called e-product sales. So basically we built the plants, we install them at the sites, but we uh, operate them ourselves and then we sell the fuels. So basically you can come to us and order uh, e-fuels for your uh, fueling station, for your automotive company or whatever it is. Basically, it's not a um, business to customer business, but it's a business to business uh, thing. Uh, so the minimum the minimum amounts we sell uh, per, per customer are 100 tons per year. So it goes rather a larger scale, but this is the new business model we're following since this year and we're pretty successful with that. Um, again, showing what we're actually doing, we're building the plants and then we need renewable energy and carbon dioxide. Uh, providing fuels for sustainable mobility and uh, the advantages are obviously that you don't need a new infrastructure you can use the fueling stations you can need uh, you can you can uh, use your existing cars and uh, nevertheless you are co2 neutral because the carbon dioxide which is emitted during the combustion process is again the input material for our process so that's why we call it co2 neutral and by the way the fuels are super clean because they are synthetically generated so uh, it's uh, co2 neutral but also you get less sooth and you get less uh, emissions in, in total we've built a couple of plants in 11 in total we've uh, supplied them to uh, customers in all of europe uh, two examples here one is in finland uh, it, it produces uh, co2 neutral fuels from solar but also from wood chips which are gasified and this is a super exciting uh, project at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, where we actually produce e-kerosene, so jet fuel from carbon dioxide and uh, hydrogen, which is generated from a solar field. Again, what do we need? We always need a, a carbon dioxide source. We need renewable energy. Um, in the, if, you, if you take fossil energy, it doesn't make any sense. So we do need renewable energy. We transform it into hydrogen, combine it with carbon dioxide and get different products which we sell to different industries. And uh, our upcoming most exciting project is one in Frankfurt. So this is a satellite picture of the, of the site. Uh, Frankfurt is a little bit more north, but it's very close. And uh, we are installing a plant here with an investment volume of up to 30 million euros which will then be the largest power to liquid plant in the world for the next uh, two to three years. And hopefully we will be, we will build another bigger plant. So we will keep the status of the largest power to liquid plant in the world. Um, switching from, from the company to, to the environment we are, we are in. And um, we are a Karlsruhe spin-off, a KIT spin-off uh, based in Karlsruhe. Um, if you don't know KIT, uh, KIT is one of the largest engineering universities in Germany. So of course we have a lot of uh, technology engineering uh, founders and also people. Um, we definitely as engineers uh, and definitely as techies and engineers, we need a lot of mentoring in order to get our really cool technologies and products into the market. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a, a lot of love with the product but the market fit is, is missing. So there's uh, very good programs of the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, bringing those technologies to the market. And also we have courses at KIT within the studies of, 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 of students, which enable us to found our own companies. Besides that, um, only a small number of uh, network um, institutions. One which is mo uh, most famous probably from Karlsruhe is uh, the Cyber Forum. The Cyber Forum is mainly focusing on um, actual tech Found, found, uh, found founders, so it's not about technology or engineering, it's about really IT and pushing the IT startups into the, the, the tech world and promoting them in order to be successful. But then there's also the Chamber of Commerce, which is very active. And we have several banks that are specialized in, in uh, startups. And also we have a very strong startup community, which is supporting each other, for example, with uh, barbecue events or uh, just networking with a beer. Um, so mentoring programs are one of the key facts. I think Karlsruhe is really a hotspot for, for founders. You can find all informations within, within the network. 
and you have really access to free and low cost technical infrastructure, which is basically provided by the platforms like CyberLab, but also KIT. So if you need uh, drilling machines, you will find them at KIT, for example. If you need uh, IT infrastructure, you will probably find it at CyberLab or at the companies which are active, stay, are active there. You get a lot of trainings, so um, you find every training which you would like to find. Uh, you just have to look at the different platforms, accelerators, boot camps, and also this is super interesting. Although Karlsruhe is a rather small um, um, city within the um, startup world, we we still have um, very active um, investors, um, business angels, but also we um, benefit a lot from the national. Um, subsidy programs um, so that's also the point where i would like to go to the baden-württemberg as a community or as a as a regional hub and baden-württemberg provides uh, subsidies for example um, baden-württemberg is one of the strongest areas within southern germany which is uh, famous for its um, engineering um, machinery and also car manufacturing uh, capabilities uh, porsche Bosch uh, Daimler is sitting here. So we have a strong focus on, on actual manufacturing. Um, there are regular networks and events and competitions. We've already heard from Freiburg about uh, GROW. We've heard about uh, several subsidy programs like the uh, Young Innovators, which provides young teams the funds in order to be successful in the market. Um, and also the way of thinking. You, you see that we, we are uh, very open-minded. We are a community which welcomes and strives for innovations. So we listen to people and we also would like to connect with you. And that's also um, the answer to the questions why people actually want to connect. And basically we've learned that we can, um, together we can do a lot more than we can do as a single company. So we want to get different uh, point of views. We want to connect with you. We want to learn from you. And also we want to uh, have the uh, opportunity to learn from you how to actually expand and prepare for the expansion into, into other areas. So if I hear from, from companies from France, it's super interesting because France is so close and we would like to learn from you how to be uh, successful in the French market. Thank you very much for your attention. Philip, thanks a lot for you. Um, a question, I will start with a, with a, with a, with a short question. Well, as a spin-off, um, the teams and the project, they are often highly connected and also dependent on the university that are um, working with. Could you explain your entrepreneurial journey and which role the KIT with all the support systems played in that? Since we have um, quite a lot of students also in, in the audience, so we can share these insights with them so that they may be also you know, see how it is possible to make the next steps. Um, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology is a great platform for you to um, develop your technology. So our, in our case, we've developed the technology during PhDs of my co-founders. And then of course the patterns are within the KIT. So the technology belongs to KIT. And the first step for you is to negotiate with university how to actually bring the technology from KIT into your company and then um, market it. So sell it uh, to its customers. And uh, this was the first step in combination with another step, which only KIT and other universities can provide, which is applying for national subsidies. So due to regulations in the EU, it is only possible for, for universities to apply for those kind of fundings. And KIT can provide uh, access to those fundings, which are namely, for example, the EXIST program, uh, Gründerstipendium, but also uh, Forschungstransfer. But then there's uh, Young Innovators from Baden-Württemberg. So there are different subsidy programs from different levels of the government, and you can apply via KIT. And um, then, to be very honest, uh, KIT is a great university, but then you should try to get away from KIT because KIT is university and you want to make money. And therefore, you have to find a way from away from KIT and going into the market. And for us, this was very important to get our own office out of KIT. Uh, to now, we have a production facility, so uh, 15 people are working in, in production. We have a production hall, and this is something that um, you should find yourself without university to accelerate your growth. Okay, great, um, Kimsey. 
Okay. Um, at the moment, uh, we have uh, we have no questions yet, but I would like to know, Philip, from you. It seems like you've come um, a very long way already. You mentioned a little bit early a team of fifty people. Um, if you look into the future, like where do you see yourself with Eneratec in say five years, or say three, and then five years? Uh, yeah, so we we had a growth of about 50 to 80 percent per year, uh, which we basically did almost on bootstrapping. So we've we've grown with only one small investors. The German uh, uh, participants of the panel know about Hightech Gründerfonds, which is an early stage investor, which is on, uh, also co-funded by the German government. So we've only applied for, for this money, which is 1 million euros. And if you imagine 50 employees and 1 million euros, well, the money is gone pretty quickly. So you have to have real actual um, business with customers. And that's what we try to do. And our, our um, prospects for the future are, are great. We hope that we can keep this growth uh, going. And ultimately, we would like to um, enable access to investors from from the public so basically doing an ipo maybe during next years but this is still um plans it's still in in we're still working on it uh, i hope it's going to be possible but uh, we will see great thank you i don't uh, i don't have any more questions in the or any questions uh, in the chat right now if you dear viewers uh, would like to use the opportunity to ask philip a question and now is your chance um, i would like to add one more uh, Philip, of course, this is an international international stage that you are on. Is there a message to our international audience that you would like to promote? An actual message to the uh, audience. So, um, in my opinion, a startup startup is comparably easy if you understand that you're not alone. So, uh, always, if you have problems, if you have issues, then uh, try to talk to people. And for example, if you want to go to Austria do not think that you are able to do it by your own because uh, there are other mechanisms uh, or, or France, there are other mechanisms, there are other way, ways of thinking. So um, I would recommend always to connect because this, what's, uh, this, this is what makes uh, Karlsruhe as a city, as a founder city uh, successful. It helped us a lot and it saved a lot of money because we didn't need any consultants. And uh, basically that's, that's what we really try to do and what I would recommend to the other teams. We do have a question at the moment, and that is the question of costs. Can you tell us how does the cost of e-fuel compare to traditional fuels? Yeah, sure. So um, two points. First of all, it is more expensive than crude oil. I always compare it to cucumbers in, in a supermarket. Uh, basically, you have two cucumbers right next to it. Uh, it's the normal cucumber and the, the, the bio or the organic cucumber. And they look the same. They taste almost identically, a little bit better. Um, but still, people buy the organic because they decide to do it. And that's exactly the same with the fuels. If you only look at the price of the fuels, then you might not be our customer. Um, on the other hand, the prices for e-fuels will drop. So the price of e-fuels is mostly depending on the electricity. 80% of the price is related to electricity. So the, the challenge is go to countries with very cheap renewable electricity, and then you can reach prices of below one euro pretty quickly um, per liter. And this is the goal. But still, uh, if you know the prices for fossil fuels, it's about 40 cents without taxes. So it will still be uh, the double the price. So it, it will be a decision of the customer whether they buy it or not. Okay. And why is it that we can't get e-fuels at every gas station in our area here? <laughs> What can you do to change that? We, we actually, we are working on that. So uh, I'm not allowed to talk about it too much, but we've uh, acquired, just acquired a, a customer yesterday, which will make exactly this possible in 2022 to 2023. So we are working on it. Great, fantastic, thank you. And I also would like to mention one thing. So yesterday we, um, we have listened to a great presentation by Professor Konduri, and um, she offered um, contacts to main institutions to get funding in this sustainability and responsibility field. And she was really open to connect teams and projects. And she said, there is a lot of opportunities actually. So for all of those, um, and uh, Philip, you also mentioned the importance of those funding uh, opportunities. So for all of those who have um, project in this field, 
um, yeah, we can also connect you to those people that have access to institutions, have access to funding possibilities. So just reach out and use the options and possibilities that we create here in this uh, forum. Philip, thanks a lot for your presentation. I see we Thank you. Thank you. Do you have one more okay. question, Philip, before you go? <laughs> I'm just going to uh, come back here. Is your solution interesting for railways? Michael would like to know. Uh, yes, if the railway is not connected to the uh, to the grid, to the electric grid, it is because uh, else you would have to invest into the grid. Uh, in Germany, about I think it is 85% of the grids, so the main lines are connected to the electric grid. But there are a lot of uh, railways in the north of Germany where they actually still use diesel engines. So uh, we are also talking to those guys and trying to um provide e-fuels for those locations where electrification doesn't make any sense thank you philip thank you thanks a lot okay so then we can move on to our next presentation um this time it is the saloniki uh, greece and um, i welcome the to the main stage um the uh, next 10 minutes uh, are yours Hi, th thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be addressing this uh, multicultural audience and a pleasure to be part of this EPICO uh, endeavor that is just starting. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Can you we, see my screen? We can see your screen, it's perfect. Great, wonderful. So hi, uh, I'm Theo Harris, I'm the Managing Director at Troy Urban Technologies. Uh, we are a software company that develops state-of-the-art applications for the transport industry. Well, a lot of words are on your screen. What we do in a nutshell is we work with cities, universities, and large corporations and help them cut down on bureaucracy, improve productivity, and in essence, bring their R&D concepts uh, on the transportation industry to the market. In that regard, we have, de we have developed uh, quite a few products. One is Electrio, which is a platform that we provide to cities that helps them uh, map where to put charging stations uh, in the urban ecosystem. So uh, where is it better to put charging stations for your electric car so that its usage is maximized? For example, this is one of our products. And another one, is uh, a work that we've been doing with ports around Europe that helps them uh, manage their uh, consumption of electricity, liquid fuels, water, and hopefully more sustainable fuels, as Philip was describing in the previous talk, uh, and then in the uh, and then actually uh, predict what the usage will be in the future and employing some very fun algorithms to cut down on their costs. So these are two of our main products. We're very active, as you understand, in the area of transport, mobility, and sustainability. Uh, we've worked with cities to automate all their parking, uh, all the parking services that they provide to their citizens and how they can improve that. But we are also uh, very involved with R&D. As you understand, we are in Thessaloniki, in Greece, and we work very closely with the university here to develop uh, products or even uh, proofs of concept that in the future help us bring them to market. So an example of that is this. This was a collaboration with Nissan. We helped them uh, develop an app for rapid incident management. So let's say something happens uh, in the uh, um, production floor, a part is not as it should be or an accident occurs. How do you report that and how do you get analytics on everything that relates to the production in a large power plant? And the problem here was that many companies still use paper and pencil to report that. So we brought a very uh, advanced and easy to use method here we, by working with actually a German company as well, the UID, who designed the UX for this wonderful application, as you can see. Uh, another one is we have been doing research and have been very involved in the uh, accident management sector. So um, this was a collaboration with the Aristotle University where we developed 
uh, solution uh, aimed at uh, cutting down on the black spots in cities. So black spots are where you get uh, fatal accidents with it, with pedestrians and cars. And one uh, of the Theo Harris. Theo Harris, yeah. ex excuse me to interrupt you. We have some difficulties to understand since your um, um, your voice is, is cutting up. Oh. Could you, maybe you can uh, switch off your camera so that the uh, sure. bandwidth would be yeah. um, hopefully better. Mm -hmm. mm, let me see. I can do that. Probably. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me better now? Well, we will see. We will see. Just keep going. Okay, okay, okay. yeah. So uh, I, I was here. We helped cities cut down on uh, their accident, their pedestrian accidents, by illuminating crossings in a cost-efficient way. This is actually a, a, an LED strip that is powered by a, a solar array, uh, which is doesn't even need to be connected to the grid and helps everyone be see crossings much more clear, much, much more clearly. Uh, and uh, of course, we've been very happy to be recognized as one of the top mobility companies in Greece uh, by oh, most of the large uh, players here and in uh, Europe. And we've been very happy that our effort has been recognized. In the future, for us, uh, just recently, we uh, got involved in a project which is part of a European research funding project, which will work on electric vessels and how uh, do you create batteries that power these vessels and at the same time uh, make these batteries cost efficient for the mass market. Uh, the, our case study will be Rotterdam and uh, ships that sail rivers and coasts. So this is pretty much who we are and what we do as a company. We uh, are still a small company, about 10 people right now in Thessaloniki, but we've been rapidly expanding. Uh, and now uh, you should know some things about Greece since many times uh, people are, are not as informed about our ecosystem, our third ecosystem. So, uh, the side of the system here in Greece is flourishing. It's not as deep as uh, Germany's, for example, but uh, it's seen year and year growth of over 100%. So a large array of startups right now are popping up. Uh, this is mostly uh, driven both by a growing economy in Greece, which is now rebounding from the crisis that uh, we've had and uh, also by students that uh, are very much more involved with European collaborations and uh, international partners. We've been uh, more open to all of this. However, uh, there's, also, there's always an issue in any country, in Greece a bit more, that uh, if there's a problem in the ecosystem is that there's still quite a lot of red tape bureaucracy. So in order to get started, you may need spend a bit more effort uh, to do that. But as soon as you get started, the people and the ecosystem here is very helpful and uh, will, if you collaborate, you will go very far, very quickly. And, uh, but you asked me why you should come here. So my idea and uh, national idea actually is that you don't really need to bring your company or your startup in Greece as a whole. All you need is to bring your development or your research in Greece as the technical personnel here is much, much cheaper than other countries. And the cost of living, of course, and the cost of having a company here is much, much cheaper as well. Uh, lastly, and this is uh, dawning more with the start of the COVID uh, pandemic, is that we've seen uh, working from home being more and more prevalent. Uh, what we predict uh, as an ecosystem and as a country is that with working from home uh, becoming a new norm or uh, much more common, uh, a lot of people and maybe some people in the audience come, can come live and work from Greece and actually work for, for a company in any other country. The 
of course, uh, what you get when you are in Greece is that, of course, your costs are lower, the weather is much nicer, and you get the opportunity to experience a new environment. And actually, after you finish working, you can like walk five minutes and take a swim. So uh, this is my, uh, my, my idea and how we recommend anyone uh, can come to uh, work with us in our ecosystems. It's been a pleasure talking to you and it's been a pleasure being invited to uh, represent the Aristotle University as a startup of choice. Uh, it's, been, it's been very interesting hearing all your presentations on such an array of topics. And we really, really look forward to maybe uh, landing some cooperation deals uh, with uh, startups that we've, been, that we've heard from, if uh, we can find something, or even working with universities outside of Greece on developing new products. Thank you again, and uh, feel free to ask any and all the questions that you have. Thank you for your presentation, Theoharis. So you really know how to attract people, I would say. So with good weather, working from home and cheap living costs, so you got me. <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's really true. So cool. Um, thanks a lot. Um, maybe we can start with the first question. Um, what was your biggest challenge in your entrepreneurial journey and how did you really find this idea? Um, because, you know, Entrepreneurs, they of course start with some some basic ideas, but what was it in your case? How did you evolve um, the main ideas that you now pursue? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. And uh, I think that one that relates to any and every entrepreneur. So I'd say our biggest initial challenge was finding our market fit. When you're a company that works with cities and large organizations, it's quite hard to find where you fit in the B2B chain. So we started trying to work with cities directly, and then we found that maybe collaborations work better with us, and then we tried some other things, and in the end we landed where we are here, where we are part of large consortiums or large co collaborations that help uh, big clients achieve what uh, they want. So this was our initial challenge. Of course, if I have the time, I would add another challenge, which is being young and being a, uh, when starting as students, uh, it's quite hard initially to attract clients when you are like 20 years old. Uh, but all you have to do in order to um, overcome that barrier is to be more persistent and to prove that your technology and your company has actual worth and is not just a side project. Um, maybe you can try now to switch on your camera. We can oh. see if the tone will still stay stable. So we can um, have you on, on this virtual stage and also interact. Sure. Let me check. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, perfect. Well, um, look, we are at universities. We are, you know, as educators, we are developing entrepreneurial competences and skills. and. Um, and some students, they, they are really uh, thinking about starting their company, doing their project, but they are afraid not having the right competence skill set uh, right in the beginning. So they are more uh, in the technical field, for example, studying something more specific. And then they, do, they say, well, I do not have this business administration knowledge. Would you say this is super important to have it? when starting or is it something that you can acquire maybe over time? Oh, um, yes, this is a problem I'd say for anybody, not even, not just students, but a lot of people wanting to start their own company. So um, in my experience, the most important thing is uh, being willing and trusting yourself to learn new things. So nobody knows everything. Certainly if you're doing a startup which does innovative things, you can't be an expert in anything and you don't have the money to get an expert in everything. So you have to believe that you can learn things and uh, you have to trust uh, in your abilities to achieve that. Uh, another good tip uh, echoing our, the previous speakers is that uh, as long as you engage with your network, you can fill in gaps without having to bear uh, huge costs. So, Maybe I don't know 
business management, but maybe I can go into an, an incubator and a, or an accelerator and, and I can get a coach that helps me with that. Or maybe I don't know web development, but I can collaborate with a new startup that is founded in my city and they can help me build my website. So yes, uh, believe in your competencies and, and your ability to learn new skills and always, always engage with your network. Mm -hmm. And also have the vision to move on where you want to go, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Kimsey, do we have something from the chat? Okay, uh, so um, I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, uh, Theo Charis, I'd like to also say you also got me sun and beach. Uh, that sounds absolutely fantastic because if I look outside my window right now, unfortunately, I don't see either no sun, no beach so far. So I'm definitely, um, I would very much be willing uh, to come to Greece to work there. Now you mentioned a little bit earlier red tape that you had difficulty sort of circumnavigating the red tape. Is there any helpful tips or hints you can give to our audience members out there in their startup environment what they can do if they possibly have a, a what seems like a dead end because of red tape where could they go what could they do what advice do you have well the way uh thank you first of all for your question uh the way that i'd suggest young people uh, circumnavigate the red tape is don't try to do it to do it yourself uh it's very hard and uh the, mechanism that, the mechanisms that you're dealing with are usually very, very deep waters. Uh, so the idea here, and uh, going back to what I was saying before, is to trust and engage with your network. Some things uh, in any country are just things you learn as you go. So finding a partner or a mentor or uh, an investor who is much more experienced in the market than you can be the key, it was for us, in unlocking a lot of these processes. Someone that knows that, hey, okay, I know this thing that you're doing is not going to get through. Let me tell you how this is going to work better and how you can help the red tape as well understand what you want to do. Many times I should note, when you're a startup, it's, very, it's quite harder for people to uh, see the value in what you're doing, especially if they're not within your market segment. So when you try to engage with uh, the government or any other red tape processes, it uh, many times leads to a dead end. So find someone who has much more experience uh, navigating these waters. Great. Thank you very much, Theo Karas. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now we need to move on for the next uh, and the last presentation. So we have 15 minutes for 10 minutes presentation and we have some time to discuss. Um, Rafael, I'm also inviting you to the stage now and um, wish you good luck for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation for this uh, event. And I would like to present at the beginning my startup and my idea. Let me just share the screen uh, with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I hope it's there. Uh, we can so see. So I'm from. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I Solutions Company. This is the company which is uh, grow from the Adam Mickiewicz University in Poland. Uh, the university is our shareholder. So this could be interested for for you uh, in this <clears throat> in this group of universities. So we are one of those who who, who really grow up from the from the university. And I'm at the same time when I'm I'm uh, I'm a founder of this company. I'm an assistant professor at the at the university, and I'm still working here, teaching students and making research. And I will talk about about the paper uh, because. Uh, Paper is everywhere, actually. So when you look around, you see at any uh, any field of uh, economy or anything, at, uh, you can find a paper. You can find an education in healthcare, in hospitals, uniform sur services, newspaper, of course, surveys, fin financial market, everywhere. Papers, absolutely everywhere. 
At the same time, the trend is paperless because it's labor intensive. We don't like paper, it waste resources. It's, it's complicated data search when you need to, to search something in a sheets of paper. It's, it's not very nice. But on the other hand, we still use paper. Why we use it? Because paper is many times essential. essential. We have the wet signature, which is the most uh, safe uh, way of signing the documents and also the, the most uh, <clears throat> uh, understandable for, for many people. It's very intuitivity and the paper is very high available. It's everywhere uh, in the world. Everybody knows what, what is the paper. I can, I can tell you always that about this wet signature and intuitive and importance. We have a lot of, we cooperate in, with banks that I will mention later, and we have a lot of immigrants in Poland and they send money to, uh, to way back to, to, to their homes, to the uh, original country. And when they go to the bank and put the money in the bank, bank uh, uh, <clears throat> transfer, uh, they want to get out from the bank with the paper, with the proof of the, what, the money, what they send, because the money, which is not so big for you, for them is a lot of money. And they want to have the proof that when they leave the money, they have the, the, uh, the paper proof that they give the money uh, in the bank. So the paper is essential. And what we do, we combine those two, uh, those two word, because we have, we have the solution about the digital pen. Digital pen is the, pen like this. I hope you can see this in the camera. So this is the regular pen, looks like a regular pen and works like a regular pen, uh, right on the regular paper, but whatever you write it, it's automatically in the uh, in digitized format uh, in the computer, because here you have a little camera, which can, uh, can see everything you write and can recognize the form that you write. <clears throat> uh, in at, at the moment, we, we start this, this uh, companies from this digital pen uh, concept, but at the moment we are hardware independent solution. So whatever surface you have that you can write on it, uh, doesn't matter is it digital pen and paper, is it the tablet like Vacoms or is it some other tablets like uh, Microsoft Surface or Samsung or whatever you can imagine uh, with the pen. Uh, then you can write on it and then you can have the data in one platform which is where it is digitized and and you can use the data from this form moreover we have uh, a valid signature which can be recognized and used uh, which is which is legally valid so this is biometric signature which is put inside the document and you can uh, you can different uh, the people by the graphologist using this the signature in the documents so you, you can use the pen and the paper and at the end you have the electronic version of the document which has the legal valid uh, value markets like i said at the very beginning everywhere when you use the paper you can use this technology because you can just change the pen from from the pen you use at the moment to this pen and then everything you write you have in electronic version uh, whatever it's we are healthcare if you are energy sector, communication, whatever, especially when you sign the, uh, some documents or agreement with your customer, like in the bank. Uh, so we are, um, uh, we are most proud of our uh, implementation in uh, Pekao, Bank Polski. This is the biggest bank in uh, Eastern Central Europe. Uh, at the moment, we have the pilot project with 27 pens and 37 vacuum tablets on nine branches all over the country and uh, they use it for signing the documents all the all kind of documents in the branch because you can you have to remember that when people came to the branch they want to use the paper if somebody wants to have wants to do uh, or can do something uh, by internet they don't go to the branch but some there are a lot of people still coming to the branch because they want it because they don't want to use or they cannot use uh, electronic uh, electronic process. So current process is the, when you go to the bank, you have the two, two copy of this, of one document and one goes, you can take it with, with you to, to your home. And the other one next is scanned, then it's uh, indexes, and then uh, it has to be transferred to some archive uh, and they stored for many, many times. With our technology, we have one paper version of the document, which goes with the customer to, he take it, 
to his home. And the, we have automatic electronic version of this document in the cloud. So this is technology which is already in use. We have a lot of solutions and a lot of uh, companies work on it, especially when you have this, the services which is combined with the uh, customers. <clears throat> and we are looking for searching for some groundbreaking projects like uh, the police and tickets. We are we have the first implementation of this in, in South Carolina in Arvine City uh, when the police gives the tickets to the uh, to the drivers, but also the, the exams on the, the national exams or the notary or the elections because this technology also provides you to make the elections uh, on paper by the natural way <clears throat> and this is about the uh, the technology and about the uh, the solutions let me just skip to the to the other uh, presentation about uh, about the our local entrepreneurship environment uh, so let, let me mention at the very beginning before i share the screen that uh, I like Poznań as a city because we are very different from any other city in Poland because in Poznań we don't have this big quest corporation like Google or um, you know Microsoft so on there's there's nothing like this in Poland and so when in all other cities in Poland the people after the studies especially in computer science goes to work to this big west corporation and then start to make their career uh, on it in poznan there's a lot of people who after the, after the, the study they launch their own business because this is the, the best way of doing something with your life because there's not, not no such opportunities like like big west corporation sometimes somebody once says that this is the minus of poznan but i i feel that this is the big plus because we are the we are the place when there's a lot a lot a lot uh, of startups and uh, uh, the main Polish companies was begin in Poznań and this is our main opportunities. And we have uh, Poznań Science Technology Park. This is the first uh, technology park in Poland. Uh, was launched in the 1990s. And this is the Adam, University, Adam Miskiewicz University branch who help people to, or support entrepreneurship, young entrepreneurship. Uh, Basically, by helping to uh, to raise the, uh, the the company to to set set up the company and then uh, from the very beginning by analysis the idea after the end for making to to help uh, going to the market and uh, make the funds for uh, for launching the business. So they have a lot of. Uh, uh, training opportunities and uh, also the seed funds they help they have their own funds at the with the university in Poznań that about uh, two two million euro it's it's not so complicated to to have it uh, when you have a, a really good idea and you are somehow somehow connected with the university our university but or any other university uh, from Epicur for example uh, we also combine and the business and uh, and the university. So there's a lot of program who programs that allows you to transfer the knowledge from university to to business. And <clears throat> there's also a lot of places for business that you can use in Poznan. Not only this one, but there's a lot of places when when you can when you can came and uh, launch your business. And uh, I believe that's. This is enough. Of course, cooperation about uh, from all over the world, like the Epicur, uh, but not only Epicur. There's a lot of uh, organization that that help people to change the places from from Poznan to all over the the world. Okay, thank you. So. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Rafael, for this insight. Um, now again, we have some time to discuss uh, those insights. And uh, my, my first question would be, um, do you already have customers for your solution, for your pen, and who are they? Yes, we have. Uh, uh, we, have the we have the customers. So like I said, the, our, our main prospect right now is the, this pilot project in Pekao Bank Polski. Uh, 
uh, which is the our main um, uh, let me just show it this is the biggest eastern central europe uh, bank and this is where we when we uh, when we use the technology and it it uses is used in real life scenarios so so you can go to the to, the, to these branches and sign the real documents and this work in real so that you you can take your paper copy and in the bank there's only electronic version of this document but we also use it in some in, in many hospitals in in poland that we implemented the uh, this solution for uh, for uh, for just documenting uh, electronic version of the documents uh, healthcare records and something like this okay. yeah so cool. we have we have some implementation that's that's great so maybe this is now an opportunity for you to get to know people in order to step into maybe another market like Germany, definitely uh, definitely Okay. Definitely, Fair. we are looking for some contacts uh, outside of Poland. We have, like I said, we have this one pilot project also in South Carolina, in US. But uh, from some reason, we don't have any experience in other European country. We have a few contacts in US, but nothing in in Europe. And we are looking for for some contacts uh, in European Union country or just Europe European country. Okay, cool. So I, I would have lots of other questions, to be honest, because I, I really like the idea and the, the technology. Um, but I would like also to ask Kimsey now um, if you have some questions from the chat. Yeah, the chat questions uh, are still coming in um, as we speak right now. But what I would like to know is now, uh, looking at the slide that you just showed, there was 3,500 tablets and 7,000 pens when the rollout happens with the bank. Yeah, now, I'd like to know in terms of capacity, like production capacity, do you is it limitless or would there be um, a, uh, a order that could be too big for you? Uh, or is it doesn't matter? I hope not. Uh, of course, the, the capacity of uh, production is kind of limit, but we believe that we can handle of it. Uh, about this vacuum, uh, this is uh, this is not our uh, hardware, so we can we will just buy it. And the vacuum said that it's it's not too much. Uh, about uh, our pen solutions, we hope to because of course that would they would be much more than than we produced ever before or even 10 times or even more uh, more than than we produced before but uh, uh, because of that we have a cooperation we set cooperation with some china manufacturing and they they sure they assured us that it would be fine it would be okay with this <laughs> okay I hope this is, it's true Do we have maybe questions from other teams? I don't see any questions at the moment, but uh, maybe Rafael, if I could ask you, because you mentioned you'd like to reach out also to other markets. This is of course the international stage um, with uh, not only Epicure Alliance members in the audience here on Zoom, but of course also on YouTube. So if you uh, would like to use uh, this time to also make a call uh, to get in contact with you. So um, maybe you could do that now. Yeah, of course I'm, I'm interested in any contacts I can uh, maybe I can again show my screen to to show my contacts. Uh, uh, so so of course, uh, like like I said, the paper technology, the paper based technology can can be found anywhere in the world. So this is not uh, uh, we are not limited. Uh, the sky is the limit when we can use this because I believe that everywhere in the world you can find the paper and you have find you can find the process with the paper and we can. We can handle of it, and and if you see any opportunities for uh, for using this, or for are in, or you are interested in uh, use this technology, not as a customer, but as a solution provider or something that that could help us contact with some customers in in other country. Please do not hesitate to contact with me, and this is this is my contact. You can you can see it on the screen. Thank you very much. We do have one question here in the chat right now. Have you considered uh, partnering with DocuSign? 
DocuSign, this is a very interesting question because DocuSign is uh, one of the, uh, maybe not the challenge, but uh, yes, we have one conversation in, with DocuSign about it, about our technology. They are interested in, in cooperation, but now it's gone because the pandemic situation. And uh, uh, the DocuSign, DocuSign is a very special solution which is work very well in the US and outside of the European Union, but in the European Union, it's not so well known because it's not uh, cover all the uh, low uh, needs that we have in European Union. So, so we want to cooperate in the way so that we can help them here in Europe. Somehow they can help us outside of, of Europe but like I said, unfortunately, the pandemic situation stopped our conversation. And then we, at the moment, we are waiting for um, make it again. Thank you very much, Rafa. Thank you. Thank you also from my side. So we have 12.30. Um, this is the end of our presentations, the end of the virtual startup tour. So let me share a few words from my side again. So dear viewers, dear guests, um, thank you for staying with us. Special thanks, of course, goes to the teams. They did a great job, not only by presenting their projects, but also developing their solu solutions for problems that are all relevant to us. So for us, you are the first pool of ideas and entrepreneurs from the Epicure locations. And for our future activities, we will keep you informed and we will hope that we can develop valuable programs for you. So we will stay in touch with you. Also, Kim Zais, thank you a lot for this um, Q&A managing. Um, yeah, we are looking forward to do the next steps. Great, thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for your closing words. And with that, dear viewers on Zoom and also on YouTube, I thank you very much for your participation in this program, for watching us. If you are joining us on Zoom, then we ask you to just stick around because if you are a staff member, we have a staff lunch quiz prepared for you, which uh, sounds like a lot of fun. And if you are joining us on YouTube, we're going to take a short break and we're going to be back at 1.45 with our panel discussion, which will be very interesting. So I hope you have a fantastic lunch and I'll see you all right back here at 145. Bye. Bye bye. gemacht. <lacht> ah, sind wir unter uns?